I am H.K. Edgerton. I am the president of Southern Heritage 411. You can go to my website, southernheritage411.com. I am the chairman of board of advisors emeritus of the Southern Legal Resource Center. Uh, I am past president, vice president of the NAACP right here in, in, in the city of Asheville. Don't anybody came me for that. Um, as far as the number of blacks who fought uh, for the Confederacy, there are so many different kinds of numbers, some from 60,000, 100,000. But you cannot forget those, uh, General Lee talked about his citizen soldiers. You can't forget about the support services that were given. And I don't just want to put it on blacks because there's a lot of po folks involved. I just left Oklahoma City um, where Stan Wadey, the last Confederate general, an American Cherokee Indian, also fought in the war. So I got to keep in mind all of my folks. Uh, and certainly I talk about the black folks because we have been used as the weapon of choice against the Southland of America and, and against all the kinds of events that took place during that war because folks have basically erased us from that. And as you know, William Tess Thomas Sherman, when Abraham Lincoln declared total warfare against the Southern people when they brought the theater of war to innocent men, women, and children, there was a lot of burning and stealing and raping and killing going on. So a lot of records that were kept about those men who went off to war with their masters, those, those, those letters were, were lost, those records were lost. But suffice it to say, that had not been for the services of black folks, the war wouldn't last for four days, let alone four years. And we simply have been erased from that part of history. Uh, when February comes around here in the Southland of America, I, they say Black History Month. I call it beat up on the white folks in the South Month. It's what I call it now because of what it turns out to be. We, we never talk about those women like Minerva, who was General John Hunt Morgan's body servant, who when General Hunt, General Hunt Morgan was assassinated, how this black woman stopped him from stealing his watch, and certainly they were, she was not going to let him steal the red shoes that, that General Morgan gave to her. So our, our, our service here in the South Atlanta of America uh, with the Southern Army, that's my birthplace of origin, is the South Atlanta of America. Um, a young black man said to me yesterday, you are a traitor. I asked him where he was from. When he told me New Jersey, I, I forgave him because to be a traitor would mean something to mean that I'm against my homeland, which is the South Atlanta of America. I hope I answered your question, sir. I'm born and raised here in Asheville, February the 18th. Um, the same day that the Honorable President Davis gave the first speech, his inaugural speech on the steps of the Capitol in Montgomery. And every time I go to Montgomery, I love going and stepping on that stop. And when they figured out that they better say something about the lie, they said, oh my God, and look, there's a picture of this boy with a Confederate battle flag and a gun. Well, that's Southern. I mean, you're in the South Land of America sooner or later, what, what, no matter what color you are, you're going to be seen with a battle flag, and you might sit down and take a picture with a battle flag and a gun. And they went on to say that what he'd done was inspired by the battle flag. Now, th that was a second lie. Because had that young man gone to a Sons of Confederate Veterans meeting, he would have learned about those 29 black men who rode with General Nathan Bedford Forrest, and whom Forrest said no better Confederate lived than those black men who rode with him. 29 horses shot from under, under General Forrest, and never one time that when he hit the ground did he ever worry about what was behind him because he knew that those black men who rode with him would be watching his back. He would have learned about Horace King, the bridge builder who built the, the spiral staircase in the capital at, at uh, Montgomery, Alabama, and who also, for General Robert E. Lee, built all the bridges. If he needed a bridge, he called for Harris to do it. And I'm talking about a bridge that carried horses and cannons and artillery. He would learn about Levi Carnine, a man who looked just like me, who walked thousands of miles through the North carrying letters and money back to those Southern white families. He would learn about uh, Reverend McLee, General Lee's body servant, who started more churches in the North and South land of America than any man alive, started the first credit union in America uh, on the funds given to him by General Robert E. Lee. So had this young man gone to a Sons of Confederate Veterans meeting or been to their website, he would learn about the place of honor and dignity that folks who look like me earned, made all the implements of war, provided all the food stuff for General Lee's army, stayed at home and protected those plantations when the men were away, 
And while they were not there legally, they fought beside a man that he not only called master of the man, he called family and friend. Now, I know folks say, well, it's a strange thing to have to come before the Republican Men's Club and talk about this morning. But the Republican Party in, in South Carolina, and I don't care where you are, if you're Republican, it reflects on everything and every place you are. Raleigh stood before the people in South Carolina, and I'm going to get back to that thought again. And he did the same thing that Abraham Lincoln did. He suspended the writ of habeas corpus <clears throat> on this young man because he indicted him, <coughs> uh, gave him a trial in the court of public opinion before this young man had the opportunity to go before his peers. And in America, under the jurisprudence system, you're innocent until proven guilty. And that young man is still innocent to this very day until he's proven guilty. And he could walk out of that courtroom innocent by reason of insanity because it was an insane act that he did. Lindsey Graham came out on Friday morning, Thursday morning, after this act and said that this flag had nothing to do with what that young man did. That was him. It was, just, it was him. Saturday morning, Lindsey Graham wrote a resolution, architected the resolution to bring this flag down off the Confederate Soldiers Monument in South Carolina. Well, the sad part about that is in January of 2000, I sat rest right next to Senator Arthur Ravenel on one side of me, and on the other side of me was Senator McConnell, Glenn McConnell. Back and forth, the debate went about bringing the flag off of the Capitol in Columbia, South Carolina. It was placed there in 1861, excuse me, in 1961, not because of the so-called Civil Rights Act that was going on, but because it was the sentinel of the war between the states. Well, these folks said <clears throat> it had no business on the state capitol dome that it should come down, and they made a deal. The Republican Party was very prominent in that deal making that the only place that this flag should be flown is at the Confederate Soldiers Monument at the State House. And it would never, ever, ever be removed again. Now, these folks, these opportunists, the poverty pimps, and folks like Riley, waiting for this event to happen, something like this. And they've been using black folks against white folks in the South Land of America ever since 1865. I hate to tell you folks that, but that's what's been happening. And unfortunately, black folks have been victims because they didn't know. They came out of slavery. They had no idea what they were doing. The Freeman's Bureau became electioneering point for the radical Republican Party. And I said this many times. I've been a Republican all my life, and it's not because it's the party of Abraham Lincoln. Because if it was the same party of Abraham Lincoln, I wouldn't be here. These folks, after Lindsey Graham did what he did, they began a movement to try to take this flag down off of the, off of the Capitol grounds from that Confederate soldier monument. After making a deal and promising that this would never happen again, this is different than what happened in, in, in 2000 when it came from off the Capitol. All around the country, people began to circle the wagon in the South Land of America and on the Christian cross of St. Andrew that I'm very proud to have holding here in my hand this morning. Walmart, who I'm going to whip, and a lot of other organizations began to do this because they blamed this lie. They took my flag down yesterday as I stood there in the Confederate soldier's uniform, surrounded by thousands of people, basically saying some of the same things to them that I'm saying here now, and took our flag down in shame. I don't care if you make a decision that's going down, you're going to put it in a museum, if that's what you want to do. But you cannot take this honorable flag down in the kind of shame that they did. For me, the white man in the South Land of America <clears throat> has been the only man that ever cared for the African people, bar none. 
And that includes the African kings themselves, the African people themselves. They talked about Black Lives Matter. All over the South Land of America, young white boys from the North began painting those words on the Confederate Soldiers Monument. I, I reminded these folks yesterday that in the, uni in the Union Army, and, and I'll refer to a letter that was written by a black woman, and, and she asked her friend, a white woman from New York City, to deliver it to Abraham Lincoln. And in that letter, she asked him to please, honorable sir, ask your union doctors to take care of the wounded black soldiers because they, as of now, they won't touch them. And she went on and asked them, would they please see that th those union black soldiers receive the same pay for the same job that the union white soldiers were, were getting? Abraham Lincoln never answered the, the, the letter but he talked, called Frederick Douglass in his office. And maybe I shouldn't repeat exactly what he said. Maybe I should clean it up like some folks tried to clean up what he said. But he basically told Douglass, you know, you got a lot of nerve, you black folks around here, coming here talking about equal pay. With all the prejudice associated with having you in that uniform in the first place, you ought to be glad to have it on. In the, in the Confederate Army, while those black folks were not supposed to be there legally, those white men divvied up their monies and made sure that those black soldiers received the same pay that they got. In the Confederate Army, the same doctor that took care of Ben when he was a boy and took care of Ben's master as well is the same doctor that worked on him. In the Confederate Army, it was not a segregated army, it was an integrated army. My Southland and my homeland, and when we talk about slavery, and I love talking about slavery, <clears throat> because it's not the bleeding hard thing that folks want to make it out to be, why the Union Army came to the South. They never want to talk about the Missouri Compromise, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the Louisiana Purchase, all those territories now coming into the United States, and how those folks in the North wanted to create an imbalance in Congress because they did not want the white man in the South to bring those slaves into those new territories. They want to keep those territories for white folks. They don't talk about those kinds of things. A lot of folks don't they talk about black folks voting in the Republican Party. They don't really know why their ancestors told them not to vote, but it became, it, it became very apparent after 12 years of Reconstruction when the radical Republican Party did all kinds of things in the South Land of America using, again, black folks against white folks. They were going over to the Freedmen's Bureau telling black folks how to vote, who to vote for, and that usually meant voting for the radical Republican Party under Thaddeus Stevens. And historically, to this very day, all those folks remember is that their ancestors say, don't vote for the Republican Party. Because when the Republican Party decided that they would lift the embargoes against the South and, and the blockades that they had, all the kinds of things they did in the South to turn black folks against white folks. And then they left them in 1877. They told the white folks in the South, go back over there and take your government from those, those niggas because they don't know what they're doing. They're a joke. They stole everything that they could steal around here in the South Land of America, the carpetbaggers and the scalawags, southerners, who climbed in the bank together. It's been very difficult to get black folks to understand that most of the civil rights legislation passed in this country came from the Republican Party. It's very difficult to understand that Richard Nixon had a great deal to do with minority business and certainly in the permanent action in America. The Republican Party has probably done more to aid and help black folks in the arena of civil rights than any party ever after Lincoln. And I'll tell you this, I've only been to one when they changed the major fundraiser 
It's a Lincoln Reagan banquet. I, I told them, told the Republican Party, I'll come if you let me bring my, put on my uniform. And they had a black woman that was the head, Miss Rice, that was head of the black Re Republican caucus. And I can't believe y'all let me come in my uniform. Thank you. I did. And I enjoyed it a whole lot until this woman started talking about the Honorable John Lake of the Forest in negative terms. What has happened in South Carolina? It's different. The people of South are very angry. Very, very, very angry. They, not, they may not show it a whole lot right now, but the Republican Party in South Carolina, when it made its vote in the Senate, they, made a, they lost a lot of friends. Rightfully so. Because these men went sticks to it. They know, if you're Southern, you know what happened around here in the South Latin America. I, I don't have to come in here and tell you men about the Christian cross of St. Andrews. And what it means is the spirit of the South is the gatekeeper of the Constitution in the South Bend of America. In, re in regards to the fact that General Robert E. Lee sat down over at that table April 9th in 1865 and, and, and signed a treaty and later on said, had I known that these folks were going to subjugate the South as they have done. The South has never taken its eyes off the Constitution. And as folks begin to try to circumvent the Constitution, and it's happening right now. Never in my life have I seen the kinds of things that has happened un under Barack Obama? The United States Supreme Court ruled that gay marriage is, is legal. This is the Bible Belt. Southern folks put up with a lot of things. But when the United States Supreme Court ruled in favor of gay marriage, the minority opinion said that you have usurped the power of the people. And more and more and more now, that's what's happening. And I certainly don't think that the Republican Party should, should forget it. They should not forget some of the things that's happened with the executive orders of the president and some of the things that's happening over there at the Supreme Court that I believe is, is just a political entity now and does not serve the will of the people. You better be lucky. You better thank God we're in the 21st century and Southern people think a little bit different because I'm going to tell you this right now. With the dishonor that was given to this flag as it came off the Capitol Dome and the lies that were told about it, if we were not in the 21st century, I believe in my heart you will be looking at secession again, honestly looking at it again, because Southern people are unhappy, rightfully so. When people can walk around, they can look at this flag and they can just turn their heads up and say it's just an old rag. It ought to be in the museum. Don't you ever think that. It is the spirit of the southern people. And their spirit has been stepped on. Anybody have any questions of me? Don't y'all go out of here with boogers on your nose. You know one thing about a southern man. If you got a booger on your nose, he'll hand you a handkerchief. If you know, if he lets you walk, walk around all day long with that bug and talk about you. So I know you may have some things in your mind that you may want to ask me. You better ask me now because I'm going to go talk to my pretty girlfriend. You done fed me. I'm feeling pretty good now and I woke up. How you going to change it? Education. The people. You have to go to them. I spend a whole, almost every day. I can't go anywhere now unless somebody asks me something. People are afraid to talk about things. You can't not be afraid to talk about it. You got to be able to talk. You know, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a real hard fan of Donald Trump. But I like the man because he speaks his mind. There's too much vacillating going on. There's too much riding in the wind. Whichever the way the wind's blowing, we'll go. Lindsey Graham was a perfect example of it for me. You know, when Lindsey Graham said... This flag had nothing to do with what happened up there. Leave it alone. I was so proud of that man. And then the next day he came in and said it's got to go. That is almost admitting that all the things that folks have written about the South. You know, Patrick Ronan, General Patrick Ronan Claiborne said, if we lose this war, the North will write the history. They'll never tell the truth. 
Truth don't get told around here. I, like a man, has conviction and courage that will tell the people. Since when the southern white men not be able to talk to southern black folks? That's when. We family. You must tell them. We've been in the Republican Party. We've been waiting around too long to go down into the black community. You should have gone down in the black community. <laughs> there is no black community anymore. We, you, you have to think about the Mexican. The Spanish, they have an influence, a huge influence. They had an influence in the war between the states around here. People don't talk about that inclusion, but they did. I think you have to have a forum and allow folks in to talk. And I think you have to talk in your general over day-to-day -day lives. You got to tell people the truth. You got to tell them. I had a hard time yesterday standing around all those people that came to assassinate my flag. My little brother and myself, I'm talking about if you've ever been in a hostile environment, surrounded as far as you can see, Surrounded with them. But you got to walk up, plant yourself, and tell the truth. They can call you what they want to call you. As I said, I've been called a lot of things because one girl called me a handsome man. I, I really liked that because she was real truthful about her talking. About <laughs> you know. Yes. That's why I hope I answered your question. You gotta set it as a priority. Could Go you? down into the valley of the beast and look him in the eye and talk to him. Could you could you un unfurl that flag and, and and tell us what it what it means, how it came about, what that cross is, and everything? Uh, I can do that. I'll even do a poem about the flag. Sixty nine A.D. in a place called Priosa, Greece, <coughs> Andrew, the first apostle of Jesus Christ, stood. Folks gathered around. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, he said. An old Russian prosecutor came up to him and said, boy, we ain't going to have you around here preaching about your Lord and Master Jesus Christ. If you keep on preaching about him like that, we're going to nail you to the cross just like we did Jesus. And Andrew said, I'm not worthy. If you're going to put me up on the cross, just strain me up there and warm up an X. Because Andrew knew that X in Greek it's an honorable symbol. First three letters in Christ's name. You put your X on the paper, people don't know. Because that is an honorable symbol, <coughs> that's why it is accepted if you couldn't write your name. For three more days, Andrew continued to preach. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, he said. And after three days, people gathered around and said, put that old man down. Take him off that cross. And they put Andrew down, and Andrew died. And many years later, Constantine dug up his bones and sent him back to his native land of Scotland. And that X was Andrew. The Scottish flag looked at X with Andrew. And when the southern men went into war, folks always call this the stars and bars, but it's not the stars and bars. The stars and bars looks like the stars and stripes. Because most of the Southern folk felt like the Yankees hijacked the flag anyway. They felt like it belonged to them. And in that battle that Beauregard, his men were in, when the flag fell, they didn't know what side was what. And they started shooting at each other's men. So after a lot of debate, the South came up with this derivative, the Christian cross of St. Andrew, the Southern cross. No, and that was how it began. And the stars are what, for what? The 13 stars on there for what? Those are for the stakes that succeeded. Started out, it wasn't 13 at first. It was seven. I'll do a poem about it, my flag. And then I'm going. Y'all can't hold me any longer. <laughs> <laughs> Written by Dr. Bradley, past commander of the Sons of Confederate Veterans in the state of Tennessee. When the face would change, they could not accept. The mighty men of Valor began to gather. Brothers, native to the southern soil, 
They pledged themselves to a cause, the cause of defending family, fireside, and faith. Between the desolation of war and their homes, they interposed their bodies and chose me, the Christian cross of St. Andrew, the first apostle of Jesus Christ as their symbol. I am their flag. I was at Sumter when they began in jubilation. I was at Big Bethel when the infantry fired its first volley. I smelled the gun smoke along Bull Run in Virginia and at Belmont along the Mississippi. I was at the debacle at Port Donaldson. I led Jackson up the valley. For seven days, I flapped in the turgid air of the James River bottom as McClellan ran from before Richmond. Sidney Johnson would die for me at Shallow, as with thousands of others whose graves are marked sine, nomine, without a name, unknown. I, the Southern Cross, I am their flag. I was a shroud for the body of Stonewall after Chancellor's bill. Men ate rats and mule meat to keep me flying over Pittsburgh. I tramped across the wheat fields with Kemper, Armistead, and Garnett at Gettysburg. I know the thrill of victory, the misery of defeat, the bloody cost of both. I, the Southern Cross, I am their flag. When Longstreet broke the lines at Chickabauga, I was in the lead. I was the last off Lookout Mountain. Men died to rescue me at Missionary Ridge. I was sensed by the wildfire that burned to death the wounded in the wilderness. I was shot to tatters in the bloody angle at Spotsylvania. I was in it all, from Dalton to Peachtree Creek. And no worse place did I ever see than Kennesaw and New Hope Church. I, the Southern Cross, I am their flag. I was rolling blood at Franklin, stiff with ice at Nashville. Many good men bade me farewell at Sailor's Creek. I have shrouded the bodies of heroes. I've been laved in the blood of martyrs. I am enshrined in the hearts of men, living and dead. I, the Southern Cross, I am history. I am heritage, not hate. I am the inspiration of valor from the past. Look away, Dixieland. I, the Southern Cross, I am their flag. God bless you, man. And thank y'all for having me here. Thank you. At the Republican thank you. I got to go, y'all.